Hello, this is Lumen May, County Commissioner of District 3, welcoming you to May's message. Today, we will be honoring some unsung heroes in our community, people who are doing great things in education, in the community, in the not-for-profit world. But more importantly, these are heroes who have been involved in the civil rights movement. Uh, we will have the icon H.K. Matthews. We'll have Robert Hill, the owner of 980, and we'll have tons of educators who are giving back through the educational system and working with our children. So please stay tuned as we bring to you some of the great leaders of Escambia County. Extremely excited about being here today in celebration of Black History Month. We have some tremendous leaders and, and, and community people who have sacrificed and dedicated their lives to improving others. And today, uh, I'm privileged and honored to be joined by Ms. Cassandra Smith, uh, the principal of Lincoln Park Elementary School. It's a school that uh, we've partnered with with our human services in, in District 3 office. It was uh, one of those schools that had low enrollment and had low academic achievement uh, until Ms. Smith got there. And so today, please sit at your couch, sit at the table, uh, get ready to learn something about what's happening uh, at Lincoln Park. Welcome, Ms. Smith. Hi, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How about yourself? I'm great. Well, well good, Ms. Smith, um, this is Black History Month, and yes. we know that uh, in the pockets of poverty and in our urban schools and our inner city schools, there are multiple challenges. And many times those challenges are, are not the same challenges that you will see in other schools. So what I'm going to do is kind of you know, let you talk a little bit about yourself, how did you get to be where you are, and a little bit about what you're doing, and then I'll interject and come back a little later. Okay, well, let me get started. Um, I started in the Escambia County School District as a teacher assistant. I worked that job for six, seven years, and then I became a clerk typist, and from there, I became a guidance secretary, and one day I decided I was going to go back to school. So I went back to school in 1996. In 1999, I had a master's degree. I taught in the classroom for seven years. I was a reading coach for two years, an assistant principal for four years, and one day I decided I was going to interview for the job at Lincoln Park, and I was so super excited to be able to go there because when I was at Warrington Middle, I went there when it was a turnaround school. So they applied the same turnaround model at Lincoln Park. And I have to tell you, this has been one of the greatest adventures in my life. And yes, it was a failing school. And it's not because the kids don't have what it takes. It's just that you have to hire the right teachers in order to make sure that you have the success that you want. You have to be very deliberate about your programs that you use, and you have to make sure that you're constantly taking the pulse of the school. You have to be present. Your teachers have to know that you're there to support them, and more than anything, you have to embrace the community, and I think that's something that we've done really well. And I say that because when we have parent events, 60, 70 percent of my parents show up. I have really good parents at Lincoln Park, and although they call it a high harvest area, what happens is my parents go to work every day. Exactly. Some of them work below the poverty line, but they go to work every day, they take care of their children, and they show up at school whenever we call. It's been, that's a great story. Uh, you know, I, we're going to get back into the school and all the great work that you do on the educational setting because I know the Lingle Park Neighborhood Association, the county, uh, you do a great collaboration. I mean, that's one of the reasons that uh, Lincoln Park has become a primary school for me. But there's some young lady that's at home. There's some young person that's in the school system. I mean, I think that your story is really one of those stories that should be written about in history books. You start out as a teacher assistant, you a clerk typist. I mean, you move on and then you become a teacher and then a principal. I mean, talk a little bit about that journey. Well, you know, I had great people around me. Um, I have a friend. Um, her son is in the system. Um, he's doing great work at Warrington Middle School, Bakari Franklin. His mother, Carolyn Stanton, she was my best friend for 25 years before she passed. I met her at Golding Elementary School. I was her teacher assistant. We became best friends. She always thought that I could do anything. She thought that I could hang the moon. And so with that, she was really encouraging to me. And so I just followed my path. And I remember the day the superintendent called me downtown to tell me that I had the job as an assistant principal. 
and we had um, laid Carolyn to rest um, the week before. And I remembered when I got in my car, I didn't want to call my mother. I didn't want to call my children. I picked the phone up and I dialed her number. Wow. And when I heard her voicemail, that's when I realized she's not here. But at the same time, I knew that she was here Amen. because she still... Um, I still feel like I'm working for her. I feel like I'm carrying on the work that she started. But when you have the right people around you to push you and to motivate you, and that's what I try to do at Lincoln Park, because I do have young parents, so I make myself available to promote greatness in those parents. It may be helping someone get a job. It may be helping someone get housing. I've even offered to fill out financial aid paperwork, and I think that is one of the reasons why I am at that school, so that I can be a source of strength for other women. Well, you know, Ms. Smith, every time I'm, I'm at your school, uh, you know, I can see the love and the affection. I've come out to your parent nights. I've come out to your uh, parent days and where the parents are engaged and the things that you do, the parades, the parties, you engage the kids and the children in your school like no other. And so I think that you're being a, a difference maker and I appreciate you for one, for paying it forward. Thank for you. letting young people know that, you know, you can doesn't matter where you start, it's where you finish. And I think that it gives you a unique perspective uh, to start as a teacher assistant, you know, probably at a minimum wage job to being the head person in charge. And as, what do you see uh, the difference from when you started to now? Um, not a whole lot of difference. I still see children being the same, even though we have all the technology and you know, all these things that they're exposed to, but um, they still want love. They want to know that you care about them. They want to know that you believe that they can succeed, and they want to know that you're on their side. And that's what every child wants to know, is that they have a support system. And I will say at my school, I have teachers that are extra supportive. They go to the homes, you know. I have a teacher that will call and wake a parent up every morning to go <laughs> to work because, you know, that's just what we do at Lincoln Park. So um, they want the same thing we wanted 30 years ago. <laughs> you know, I often say that, you know, every child, no matter where they're born, if they're born, uh, you know, on a hill, you know, or they're born in poverty, uh, we all want the same thing for our children. We, we want them to get a great education. We want them to become productive citizens. And so I want to applaud you on behalf of District 3 in Escambia County for being a difference maker. Thank you for coming and being a part of our Black History Month show. Uh, you are making a difference. I often Thank say you. about the living legends. And uh, for me, the great equalizer for equality is education. Uh, because education, I mean, it goes beyond all boundaries to bring about economic parity. It brings about social equality. It brings about justice. It brings about all those things that are important and near and dear to our hearts. So thank you uh, for being a participant and being committed to our children in Scamia County. Thank you, Ms. May. And, and in closing, there's anything, there's some young lady that's out there that she's a teacher assistant, she's a daycare. I mean, I'm, there had to be challenges and obstacles that you had to see as an African-American female or just as a female. But, I mean, uh, you overcame those obstacles. I often say an obstacle is just something you see when you take your eyes off the goal. So, obviously, you've reached the goal. But there, there had to be something. And if there's someone listening today, what would be the final and closing words of encouragement that you would give to some young person who wanted to go into education? Well, the obstacle for me was raising kids and not having enough money to pay bills. If I wow. paid the car note, I couldn't pay the light bill. So um, those were challenges, but I was able to overcome those. So if there is some young lady out there, whether you want to become a teacher or a business person, whatever you want to do, um, if you're struggling and you feel like it can't happen, please call me. I'm the principal at Lincoln Park Elementary School call me. I avail myself to everyone. I want to help. That's what I'm here for. Um, that's part of my purpose is to help young women. So if there's anybody out there, I don't care who you are, call me or come by and see me and I will do all I can to assist you. And I agree with that. You, you've assisted us, and we're very grateful. We're glad to be a partner at Lincoln Park. And if you're sitting there listening, uh, we have a great following, a great listening audience. And there's somebody sitting there and say, what can I do uh, to make this community better? Uh, Lincoln Park, I mean, they take volunteers. They take donations. They take support. And if it's nothing more than drop a letter of encouragement to Ms. Smith uh, or drop all the children, I tell you, you take pizza, cookies. <laughs> I mean, they just, it's like you've given them the world, you know, for a $40 pizza. So, again, thank you for listening. Thank you for being here, Ms. Smith, Cassandra Smith. Principal of Lincoln Park Elementary School, a difference maker here in Escambia County. 
I'm excited about this next segment to be talking about black history and the contributions that many of our entrepreneurs have made, particularly in the African American community. Uh, today I'm joined with Robert Hill, the owner of WRNE Radio 980, which is the voice of Pensacola, the voice of the community. And so we're excited. Welcome, Mr. Hill. Thank you. Good to be with you. Well, it's, it's good to be here. Thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule. Uh, to my right, we have a dear friend of mine mm -hmm. who has worked in this community for many years. Many of you know him from his work with Gulf Power, but now his work uh, in civil rights and community and philanthropy uh, all comes from Joe Morris Funeral Home, uh, one of the oldest uh, funeral homes in Escambia County. Welcome, Mr. Hawking. Thank you. It's my pleasure. I appreciate you inviting me. Well, well, I appreciate I appreciate you being here. Uh, and so, some people may not know the face of Robert Hill. You may be listening uh, to the radio to uh, his voice on every morning on Hill in the morning. Uh, but you know, the story of Mr. Hill, 25 plus years ago, uh, I was a young man trying to get involved into politics, into community, and I met a guy that was starting a radio station uh, because we had a void, a void, particularly in the African American community, uh, that we had lost a, a radio station and from the woods of Selma, Montgomery, I don't know where, but this man appeared, and since he's appeared, <laughs> he's been a giant in our community. So, Mr. Hill, welcome. We're going to talk to you a little bit. We're going to have a dialogue. Uh, we want to talk a little bit about the struggle, about the influence of where we are, uh, where you've seen the struggle come from, to where we're going, and just a little bit about what you do. So, um, listen, I'm just going to turn the mic over to Robert Hill and let people learn a little bit about Robert Hill first. Um, my home is Montgomery, Alabama. I went to high school there. I uh, attended Auburn University along with probably, uh, I guess, eight or ten other universities before I finally finished with an undergrad degree in criminal justice, completing the, my master's in public administration. Been in radio for, uh, I guess, exactly 50 years. Uh, worked uh, pretty much throughout the Southeast in one foreign country. <laughs> well, Mr. Hill, tell us a little bit about uh, what your radio, your community aspect. A lot of people are concerned with marketing dollars. Uh, you often say that you're concerned with making a difference in the community. Can you just talk a little about that? Uh, a, a good question. Um, I guess eight, ten years ago, I, I, I became what I, I would say non-competitive. Being competitive is not necessarily serving your community because you give them a slow, small diet of entertainment. And I chose to, in my latter years of broadcasting, to pursue a role of uh, empowerment, a role of uh, uh, informing the community of what's going on, getting involved in the community beyond the entertainment aspect of it. And so when you do that, uh, as we do a lot of talk, uh, you know, it's not exactly appealing to uh, a certain audience, so I simply have confined myself and niched out a certain audience I'd rather have um, 10 uh, marbles on the table that, uh, that I own and, and versus uh, 20 marbles that, uh, yeah, that, that kind of floats in and out of your circle all day long. You have no sense of loyalty, and they have no sense of loyalty to you also. Absolutely. Well, you know, I know, Mr. Hill, that, you know, I've been on uh, your radio 20-plus years long before we entered into politics, but, you know, uh, being engaged in politics since I probably was 15 or 16 years old, there hadn't been a congressional candidate, a Senate candidate, a president uh, that has not that has come through Prince College that hadn't called on you to be on your show, whether it's John Lewis or whether it's Kendrick Meeks or uh, any of uh, James Claiborne, uh, any uh, President Clinton, Barack Obama, Michelle Obama. They they all lean uh, to you for your understanding, and your knowledge, and you open up those airways for them. Yeah, uh, I have probably one of the the best jobs in the uh, city and the county of the state because I've had the opportunity to speak with the Bill Clintons, the Joe Bidens, uh, the Panama on the air. Uh, most folks don't know that Joe Scarborough got started working at, <laughs> uh, hanging around WRNE doing talk with us there. Wow. And so mm -hmm. we, we're very fortunate to have that relationship to you and pretty much every local candidate. Uh, it, it's, it's an honor and it's a privilege, almost an ego thing, to have, <laughs> to, to have uh, local politicians to call you and say, I need to talk with you because I'm thinking about running in the ECOA or city council. Uh, and it's good to have the relationship to introduce, not only for me, but with my audience, <clears throat> for my audience to realize that, it, gosh, if 
uh, if a Lumen May or whomever get elected, the city council or the county commission, I have a relationship with them through the radio station, and I can call the radio station and I can say, gosh, I want to speak with city council person uh, here or the county commission there. It's, 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 it's nothing compares to that in terms of getting people involved in politics, in terms of helping those politicians uh, get directed towards the community needs. I mean, it's just beyond words can explain. Well, it's not ego. I think it's wise counsel uh, for anybody running for office uh, to engage and to call you. And uh, we appreciate all the things that you do. And I tell you, when I'm deceased, I'm, my body is probably going to have to be rolled to Joe Mars uh, because I hear all the time Joe Mars funeral advertising on your radio station. <laughs> He's been with us since he took over the country. Since he took over, I just wanted to make sure uh, that we're making. <laughs> you know, I wanted to make sure that the Undertaker was advertising. I like to you know hear his name. Before. We will hold him to that. Too. <laughs> uh, no, um, Mr. Hawkins, uh, I have always admired you for your great work in this community. Uh, through your community relations at Gov Power and, and now uh, being uh, an entrepreneur and a philanthropist, uh, I mean, what got you to this point? I mean, because so many times, so many people call my office, they want to own a radio station, they, they want to, you know, go and own a landscaping company, or they want to own a funeral home. I mean, so many times they lack the, the mentorship and uh, the things that they need to engage in, and get involved. But we know how important, particularly, I mean, there's a long history. Mm -hmm of uh, funeral homes, barbershops, and those type of things, uh, in particularly in the African-American community, but you've just kind of taken it to another level. So talk a little bit about what got you to where you are today. Thank you so much. First of all, again, thank you for inviting me and having me here with you today to speak on this honor that we're talking about and traditionally talking about Black History Month. For me, that goes all the way back to my high school years in Evergreen, Alabama, and um, having talked about, we talk about picking cotton and doing some things, <laughs> but uh, my grandfather was a Baptist minister, and he taught me the value of integrity and the value of being able to say, hey, look, if you're going to do something, do it well. Mm -hmm. And from that, I branched out. I spent some time at Tuskegee University. I came to work at Gulf Power as a, just as a step, step in stone, and I ended up staying there for 42 years. Wow. And during that time, I've had the opportunity to meet great people such as yourself um, and people who are about doing some things in our community. And I thought to myself, well, they're making a difference. Why can't I make a difference? Wow. To whom much is given, much is required. Amen. And so whenever we've had issue, issues in the community, working behind the scenes, getting Gulf Power to help, I often call on you to get you involved and so forth. And that just was a springboard, if you will. Um, having talked to and been around the Mars family, I worked there part-time for about four or five years. And going back even further than that as a kid, sweeping and washing cars there um, and mowing grass. Mrs. Mars used to always tell me, say, one of the things I remembered about you, David, is you were always trying to do something. And so out of the clear blue one day, I get this phone call. And we had talked. I talked to Joe Jr. and so forth about the funeral home off and on. But she called me and said, hey, David, I need you to come see me. <laughs> if you know Miss Morris, you know that's her voice. <laughs> and so I, I did. Uh, I went to see her, and I thought, well, what does she need now? Let's see. I put a generator on the house. We changed out a heating and air conditioning system. And all these things I've done, what could she possibly need? Right. She said, hey, sit in that chair right there. I'm going to talk to you about something, and I want you to hear me. She said, son, I watched you grow from a kid. I'm going to just tell you where you are right now. You need to own this funeral home. You need to own my funeral home. And she said, I'm going to show you something. And she went in her pocketbook and showed me a check with all these zeros. She said, but I don't know these people. They don't know me. And most importantly, they obviously got me confused because they think I need money. <laughs> <laughs> I need to dance my point. <laughs> and she said, son, I'm looking for somebody that's going to take care of my families that we serve, somebody going to take care of my employees. But most importantly, somebody that's going to care about my legacy. Wow. And she said, I just keep coming back to you. I said, Ms. Morris, first of all, Hey, I got no money like that. Right. <laughs> she says, son, I'll tell you what you do. You think about it. And if that's the only issue that you have, why don't you come see me, bring your lawyer or whoever you need to talk to, and we'll sit down and we'll see if we can't work it out. Wow. And she did that because she felt that Pensacola needed to have an important legacy and a tradition keep going. And it needed to to progress and keep on going. So uh, having said that, we started out very humbly 
about four years ago now, four years in December, it's just starting at ground zero and just saying, hey, I'm just going to be a small part of this. But as I got more involved into it, it became all of a sudden a passion. And it became something that I enjoy doing. I eat, sleep it. I, I, um, at night, when we get phone calls, last night during the Super Bowl, went out to take care of a family. Those are the kind of things that I feel like that we can do to make a difference. Um, everybody can't be a Lumen May. Everybody can't be a Robert Hill. But what everybody can do is make a difference. Whatever that small voice that you have, whatever you can do, make a difference. Because right now, our young people are crying for a leader. Our young people need leadership, and it's incumbent upon all of us to be that person. That's right. Got to mention, David was also a disc jockey. <laughs> I left that part out there. <laughs> for about eight years at WBOP Radio part time. That I did not know. Yeah. I, I remember I was, Cooper Morgan and. Oh man, and, I'm uh, hurt. You, I, didn't, you never knew I, David I, Ashley. Yeah, oh, was man. that you? Oh man, the 18 karat gold show. Yeah. I <laughs> See, I'm learning something about black history. So I thought that I was... But still, thank you for being here. That's why it's so important. The 18 gold... Yeah. 18 karat gold 18 show on Sunday afternoons. Sunday afternoon. And you were David Ashley. David Ashley. Man, you... Now I can hear it in your voice. <laughs> <laughs> so I know someone's there watching and, you know, two disc jockeys, I mean. Can you still play a little bit? A little bit. A little bit. I, the, the music has changed and so it's the technique, but I can still do an oldie show. All right, well. We, we, Anytime you need to hear a little Joe Simon call on me. We may have to do, we, we, we may have to do a reunion. I'll tell you, David, I mean, you said something to me that's important to people that are listening who are watching uh, who may not know the history uh, of, of, of the funeral home business. I mean, and, and, and the great contributions and, and the, the role that it's played in community. But you said something that touched me, and you said Miss Morris was not worried about the dollars. She paid it forward. And we talk mm -hmm. a lot about how do we pay it forward, how do we build that legacy. Mm -hmm. And so I often say that a hundred years from now, it won't matter what my bank account was, the type of car I drove, the house I lived, uh, but was I important in the life of a child or a family? And that's the only legacy that lives on. Mm -hmm. and so th to me, that just pays honor to Ms. Mars mm -hmm. for not thinking of money or, or, or material things or thinking of legacy and community mm -hmm. building. So that's a, that's a great story. Well, if you know Ms. Mars, you know it, it when she got on you, you, heaven forbid, you got on her dark side. <laughs> she had a way of humbling you. She really did. <laughs> Mr. Hill, there's some young person out there in just like that says, you know, I want to get into the radio business. I, I want to do it. And we know that uh, radio has, music has been the universal uh, language for us throughout the movement, throughout reconstruction, throughout integration, to, uh, uh, to doing segregation. Now, many times the only thing that we had was a relief was listening uh, to our radios. And, I mean, can you talk a little bit about the role that radio has played and continue to play? Because people will talk now, you know, about XM radio and iPods and social media. I mean, what's the role of radio now, particularly uh, in, in, in issue-driven things? Well, uh, radio is actually beginning to redefine itself. Uh, unfortunately, it is not what it used to be um, because of satellites, because of corporate radio. Uh, they, you know, they have one programmer that plays programs 50, 100, 200 radio stations across the country. And their emphasis is um, they, are, they are stock companies and that it's to generate monies for the uh, uh, for their st stockholders. Uh, in America right now, there are approximately 14,000 radio commercial radio stations. And unfortunately, African Americans own approximately 200 of those 14,000 radio stations. Out of 14,000, only 200 across the country are owned by African Americans. Approximately 220, 230. Wow. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's by, alarming. Owned by mm -hmm. African Americans. Mm -hmm. wow. And, you know, the majority of our AM radios, we've been fortunate enough for some years ago to acquire an FM translator to complement the 980, um, but uh, it has um, uh, evolved from the 30, 40 years ago. There's some individuals such as myself that are continuing to try to uh, inform, empower, get a relationship with the community, uh, inform them about voting issues, inform them about health issues, because many African American communities across America have those issues. Right. You know, there's. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there are issues as relates to violent crime, the issues as relates to health, the issues as relates to academics that, that are instruments in terms of trying to uh, <clears throat> empower them that with, through leaders such as yourself that we need to work together to mm -hmm. increase the uh, high school dropouts to right. lower the number of uh, 
uh, you know, AIDS virus in the community and, and all the, reduce the violence. Uh -huh. So it, they, they are those, such as myself, that still have those few roles out there that are doing that. Absolutely. Well, you know, that's alarming. You just said out of 14,000, uh, there are only 200 plus that are African American own, uh, and it's great that we're one of the unique communities in America that we still have a black owned radio station. And so, I mean, uh, and when we say that, I, I see your radio station as being this universal station that informs everyone. So, I mean, it's not relegated to, you know, just African Americans because I see that when politicians, you know, when anybody running for mayor of Pensacola or running for state rep, uh, they all want to know how do I get in touch with Robert Hill. And so I think that your radio station reaches a broad spectrum of people. And I, I'm glad you said that because I, I try with great efforts to my programming. We'll do probably 30, 40, 50 people a week on my show, and I'll try to, I'll, I'll use a quota. Right. <laughs> I'll say out of those 30, 40, 50 people that I have on the air during the course of my week, during the week, I'm going to try to have you know, at least 10, 12 people with, from a white community or, or an Asian community with their perspective on information that they can bring to my audience in, in order to display to the community that, you know, yeah, we are a black program, but we are about uh, being diverse. We're all in this community mm -hmm. together to make it a better community. So, so often a, a redder will tell you, uh, people call our office every week uh, or someone's Facebooking about mm -hmm. someone, black on black crime, you know, death to gun violence, and we need to raise some money to bury them. Uh, because <coughs> obviously you can't do it for free. But I mean, I often, you know, talk about this, and it's not politically correct, but it's a public health issue. Particularly, uh, we've had 13 shootings in a row, mm -hmm. uh, black on black crime that's happening. So if there's somebody listening as a grandmother, you know, that, I mean, what are the words you would tell them? I mean, you know, I often say you need to make sure you get some insurance. I mean, mm -hmm. because the probability of your child getting shot, even innocent children get shot. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, we've had them, we were both in a funeral on this mm -hmm. past Saturday right. of a 20 year old young man who mm -hmm. I think was a great young man. Yes. Uh, and That's so, sure. so it, 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 it can happen, but we have to be educated about it. And on shows like this, that we have a ton of people listening, we have to, we have, to have that candid conversation of, you know, children, you know, need to be at home at a certain hour. They need to understand discipline. They need to understand, you know, the importance of getting a good education. But more importantly, parents, you know, it's not a matter of if you'll die, it's just when you'll die, whether it's a teenager, whether it's an adult. So, mm -hmm. I mean, there's a, a parent that's listening, a grandmother, even a child. We have a lot of young people that are listening. I mean, what would you say to those young people, particularly those who are losing their lives to gun violence? Listen, I, it's important for me, and I want you to hear me today. Young people, there is no way that anyone can tell you you can't be. You can be. We all have come up. We weren't rich. I, I, I know Mr. Hill's background. I know uh, Reverend May's background. And where we've and come I'm still from. not rich, but these two are. But the deal is, is that we care. We care. And we care about you, young people. If you have a problem, you, it, you see something's going on in your community, you want to do something about it, it's incumbent upon you to, hey, let's talk about it. Come see me. Come see one of the people you see here today. If I don't know the answer, I'll get it for you. I'll talk to people because we've got to start in our community having these dialogues. It's, it's now, it's not just the black community that we, we need to help, but we need to help our community, period, because we can all help. Oh, yeah. And so it needs to start with us in the black community, but as a whole, it's all of our responsibility as a community to make sure that our kids understand that you don't have to have a PhD to be successful. There are people who have trades that are successful. Oh, yeah. People uh, who have mom and pop stand, food stands that are successful. How do you define success? So many different avenues, so many different things we can talk about there. So my passion to you is that let's do this. So in closing, I will let you uh, say your last words, Mr. Hill, and anything that you would want to say. First, let me thank both of y'all for being great entrepreneurs <laughs> and coming on this show for, for our Black History Month, a May's message. It's been an honor uh, to be a young man uh, to watch 
uh, from afar and near uh, to see mentors and, and, and guys that I've looked up to for 30 plus years and to be able to host on May's message. Uh, it's kind of like a dream come mm -hmm. true for me because as a young man mm -hmm. going around, you know, we, we would see Willie Jr. or Hollis T. Williams or David Hawkins. You never dream of one day that you can get here. So I do believe that dreams come true. And I believe that everybody needs a mentor. Mm -hmm. I believe you got to find somebody that you can <clears throat> identify with. Mm -hmm. And you know what? you got to follow them. It may be from afar. You know, I might have followed Commissioner Jr. from afar. And so you, you have to watch and learn from everyone. And if you don't believe or if you don't see people that's doing it, you'll never believe mm -hmm. that you can mm -hmm. do it. So you have to identify with people. And so mm -hmm. I, I thank both of you guys uh, for imparting that in my life. Mm -hmm. uh, Commissioner, I just want to say uh, thank you again for uh, inviting me on. Uh, two things. Number one, uh, since this is Black History Month, let's make it a point to pick up a book, a book and read about our history. Amen. Mm -hmm. Number two, this is a political year in America. And, um, you know, as we go to the polls and vote for candidates to represent us, let's look at some issues. How will that candidate re represent me economically? Are they going to do something or are they doing something to empower me economically, either putting jobs in my community or telling me about job openings? Are they doing something about uh, health issues, not necessarily providing you with health care, but also talking to you about how to improve your quality of health? In the state of Florida, in Escambia County, we have some of the highest incident of high blood pressure, highest incidence of AIDS mm -hmm. in Escambia County, Florida, in the state of Florida. Does, is that candidate concerned about those issues? Is he concerned also about social issues as relates to, uh, as Mr. Um, uh, academic issues, as Mr. Hawkins mentioned? Is he concerned about trying to reduce the high school dropout in our community? What is he doing about that? Is he talking about uh, technical training? Not everybody's going to go to college, but is he talking about technical skills in our community? Is he encouraging us to do that? Those are just some of the things that you need to talk about other than is he going to re uh, repair the sidewalk or is he going to put street lights? Yeah, those things need to be done. But to improve the quality of life in the community, that person that represents you need to be concerned about issues such as economics, such as uh, <coughs> education, such as health issues. And with those issues, it's going to improve your quality of life. And that's how you have that upward mobility. And that's what it's going to take to go from one generation to the next generation. That's going to also abate issues such as violent crimes because mm -hmm. when they become more active, academically adept, adept to their community, reducing high school dropouts. You're going to see the reduction of, uh, of violent crimes in our community. Is he concerned about me forming a relationship with law enforcement also? When you do those things, you're going to see the issue of law enforcement and the community, those confrontations go down. Is that politician concerned about those issues, or is, is he trying to develop a wage between me and those issues? That's all I got to say. Thank you so much. Mr. <laughs> Hill, no, uh, for 50 years of service in, uh, in the radio business, you take as long as you want. Thank you. And I, when you're sitting at home, you're watching this show, I can just tell you every morning, uh, I make it a part of my ritual uh, to turn to 980 and listen at Hill in the morning because it's always informative. And thank you for your commitment to the struggle. Thank you for your commitment to equality. Amen. Thank and you. Thank you for yeah. being here. Thank you. Mr. Hawkins, thank you uh, for being an entrepreneur. We know it cannot always uh, be easy for you, but you, know, you face the challenges and you do great things. And so, uh, again, thank you. And we appreciate you sharing uh, your story uh, uh, about your career path here on May's Message. Oh, thank you, sir. And I appreciate the opportunity to come and, and share some of the ideas and say, talk about some of the issues in our community. And um, just keep doing this little by little by little. We need our young people to get the message. Brother Hill, you said it best when you start talking about economic empowerment and where do we go from here. Let's Thank do that as a community. Absolutely. You're sitting home, grandparents, uh, this Black History Month, aunts, uncles, uh, share the story of Robert Hill and David Hawkins. Uh, we have many other great uh, leaders in the community that will be a part of May's message uh, on our next coming segments. Uh, but find the opportunity to take the child down uh, to the funeral home and meet Mr. Hawkins or to the radio station. I assure you that these two gentlemen would be more than happy uh, to be a mentor, to open up their do doors and share anything that they've learned because I know personally that they both share it with me. Thank you for joining us this segment of May's Mess. I'm here again today with this third segment of great 
African American leaders in this community celebrating Black History Month. Today I'm joined uh, with Sheena Payne, the principal of West Florida High School, where my children do go to high school. So thank you for your service. Thank you. We appreciate you being here. And Robin Richard, the director, and I got to make sure that I don't make a mistake because H.K. Matthews will correct me. Kakua Institute. Absolutely. I got it right. I mean, I tell you what, that, that, that private school education finally paid off that my parents had. But anyway, we're just excited, particularly uh, we know the work that both you ladies do in community, in church, in school. And there we have a lot of people listening uh, and, and celebrating Black History Month with us. Uh, but we want to share your story and, and share the great things that you're doing in the community. So. Ms. Payne, we're going to start with you, and uh, we know that you're the principal, and uh, people see you, and I come to the school, and you're regulating, and coordinating, and doing all this great work, and your students are achieving great things, but there has to be a, a, a story uh, behind the face, and so we just want you to take a few moments from your intro just to just share your story. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. I don't know uh, how well I'll do, but I'll do my very best. I, uh, <laughs> we thank I'm, you. I'm grateful when we talk about Black History Month. Of course, one of the first things that comes to mind is Frederick Douglass, who said it was easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. Wow. And so what we do every day in the fight is try to build strong children. I am fortunate to be a part of a great uh, school with great students, uh, uh, great teachers, great teammates, and we understand that in order for you to lead, you have to be willing to serve. That's the best way to do it. Mm -hmm. So my story is is it's pretty simple to me. I think I've just been extremely blessed. Most times when you think of it, it's not because we've been so good, but because he's been so good. Mm -hmm. And so when I think about it, I went into, when I started coming through college, I had a different idea, mindset of what I would do and where I thought we would end up, I'd end up being. And then I walked into a classroom uh, at UWF uh, with under Dr. Ag Ann Agnew, and she changed all of that for me. Um, she read a story to the class I did not know. I cannot tell you the name of the story. I just know when she finished it, I looked up and I said, that's what I'm supposed to do. I took the class as an elective for another major. Uh, when you get to that point in your college career where you have most of your classes done and now you can take what you want to kind of thing. So that was one of those that I thought would be really easy to take. So I took it and she changed it for me. And wow. so after that, I went to uh, find out how I could get into the world of education. I've been blessed um, to do every area. I've spent six years teaching middle school at Wedgwood Middle School. Go Wedge. <laughs> go Wedgwood. Uh, go Wedgwood. Jerry Watson would like that. And so I uh, did one year at Brentwood uh, Elementary as a curriculum coordinator. And for the last just about 14 years, I've been uh, blessed to be at West Florida High School. And so started there. Um, I've worked both areas of assistant principal, both of facilities and then curriculum for five years. And this is my fifth year um, as principal, and I say, you know, if it goes right, then you blame everybody else at the school. If it goes wrong, you blame me. <laughs> and so, you know, I've just been very fortunate, very, very fortunate. I'm, I'm like I said, surrounded by great people in a great district um, that we have a lot of hardworking people doing the same job I do every day, and it's not easy. But again, we're back to the beginning. We're trying to build strong children. I like the way you, you introduced that and said we're trying to build strong children instead of broken men and someone sitting at home some young person I mean what would be your encouraging words to them if they wanted to go into education I would say that you have to be um, it's a it's a ministry if if you will it is not one of those it's a work of heart you know it's gonna cost you um, a lot of hours a lot of time, a lot of effort. You'll laugh a lot. You'll cry some. <laughs> um, people won't always understand. There'll be those that, that are critical and criticized. But you can't hear those voices. You have to have a channel of what it is that you know you're trying to do and accomplish. And kids need um, people. When we think about they, they there's such a need. And kids can't be what they can't see. Amen. And so when you look at... Um, even in uh, the population for minority students, we, we are looking still always for minority teachers and those that would come into the profession and stay with us. And, and we understand for, for anyone that's doing it, it cannot be about the money. Right. Um, it, it cannot be. But there is no one in any profession that started without a teacher. Absolutely. Everybody started in the classroom. And everyone, if you really take time to think about it, can think back 
to their favorite teacher and they can also think back to the one that was not a favorite, <laughs> and which is why the work is so important Absolutely. because you want kids to look back and say you know I had Miss Payne I had Mr. May I had this person and they made a difference if no more than told me that I could that's right. when everybody else and all my situation said I couldn't that's right but that person stepped in and said yes you can mm -hmm. and I did it anyway oh. so Wow. No, Sheena, thank you so much. Don't leave us. Stay here. I mean, we got a few more questions for you, but we're going to turn over to who I call the oral written history guru of Belmont de Villers uh, of this community, uh, many times the conscious, uh, uh, particularly uh, African-American studies in, in, in this community. County. Robin, thank you for being here. Oh, thank you for the opportunity, especially to share the stage with Sheena. It's like i got to <laughs> conjugate my verbs right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Or oh, maybe Hicks will be watching. Oh, man, oh yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah yes, I'm nervous will. around a teacher as well. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, but, Robin, uh, what motivates you to do what you do? And I mean, talk a little bit about your projects. I know that you've just, I mean, with the Rosemont Johnson Beach was mm -hmm. the only beach that African Americans could go to. Mm -hmm. You worked with Raymond Reese on that. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, the, the history of Belmont Developers, mm -hmm. uh, you've worked on that. I mean, talk a little bit about some of the work that you're doing as it relates to black history. And some, I mean, no, you just opened up your, your new museum, and so you're just kind of an historic. Belmont de Villa is the oldest, one of the oldest African-American neighborhoods from the state of Florida. You just, you've kept it alive. Well, um, um, it, like Sheena said, it's been a team effort, and I, I was really fortunate, um, I was lucky enough to come in on the story, on Belmont de Villa's being built. I heard, um, I heard as a child growing up, I heard all these fantastical stories about my four parents, my great-great-grandparents and, um, um, and my aunts and uncles and what they did and then I come to find out that most of them were true so a lot of them were funny but most of them were most of them were true and so it was about this effort to buy land to pass legacy that my family still lives on and um, how they farmed and sold and 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 were entrepreneurs and um, um, we would find we cleared some land and we found we found these brown bottles on the land and so my dad said I was like dad I was like 12 13 years old and my dad, I said, well, what are these? And he said, well, these are um, uh, spirit bottles, you know, so liquor, liquor bottles. I said, oh. Uh, he said, well, in our family, we had uh, bootleggers and preachers. So you get the spirit one way or the other in this family. And one and so, two. One and two, yes. Yeah. Yeah, one way you get your spirits. So those stories I kept hearing. And so when black history came uh, about, I remember in middle school or high school, uh, and saying, you know, you need to go to the library to hear about black history. I didn't have to do that because no. I heard these stories and we had the books at home. And mm -hmm. so it was this thing. And so at the time it was Black History Week. Uh, and so it was, it, was, um, it was important to me to share some of that because I'd heard this. And so, I, you know, the, the, the sort of ones that we know about are important, but it was all these other stories. And so... Um, so that kind of propelled me as I became an adult and didn't see my story being included in whatever I was doing, whether it was um, teaching in, uh, with the military or banking or um, in public television. I didn't see my story represented my face. Sheena talked right. about the visual, what a child will see, a child will be. I didn't see a whole lot of that. And so, but I knew that what we did was important. And so that sort of formed what I could do in Belmont de Villers and how I wanted to go about putting that into uh, play. Pensacola wow. is this amazing place, but we've only told part of the story. Wow. And so Belmont de Villers uh, represents for a lot of people that sort of dense story of the African-American experience in Pensacola. It's not the only one. There's right. Wedgwood, there's Warrington, uh, uh, Perdido, Century. There's so many places that the African-American experience is. But for me, Belmont de Villiers represents a lot of that. And so, um, so we tell with the Kakua Institute, we tell stories uh, in art, history, science, and technology uh, about the African-American experience. And so we want people to discover, share, celebrate, and grow the African-American story. Um, so we do that through robotics, um, teaching students history. Uh, they don't even know that they're learning the history, right. so we teach them how to program a robot, and they they're, they're learning about the history of Rosamond Johnson in the you know in the process. Right. Um, virtual reality, we recreated uh, Belmont de Villiers uh, nineteen early nineteen hundred, so they can put on the glasses and walk down the street. Um, wow. uh, so we've done some some different uh, projects like like that have conversations uh, what, that we think that matter to further, again, the art, history, science, and technology along. Robin, there's someone that's watching this television show, some young person uh, is, is watching this, and if they were listening and said, well, why is 
African American history or black history, why is it important in my life? I mean, what would you say to, the, to a person that's watching today? Uh, uh, because it is. <laughs> it's, it's just that simple that it doesn't have to be a reason and excuse. Your, your story matters. You matter. And so your story is important. And every day you're building that story. And your story deserves to be shared and celebrated. Um, those stories that you see on YouTube and, you know, on, on entertainment, is are, those are important. You have just a fantastical story as they do. And yours deserve to be shared. And so, um, and, and it's not, um, I, I love uh, Black History Month. I absolutely love it because we heighten uh, our, our stories. And every, and every single day, your story deserves to be shared. And so don't, um, uh, what's the word, not decline. Don't, don't little, be little yourself to elevate somebody else to make them feel good about themselves. You have to every day feel good about yourself. Your beautiful hair, the curls in your hair, uh, your beautiful skin color, your smile, the way you talk, the way you dress, the way you say something or the way you interpret something, all of that's important. Don't ever let anybody decrease you to increase themselves because that ain't why we're um, here standing on the shoulders of people like uh, Robert Hill, H.K. Matthews, Aretta Green. We're here standing on these shoulders and so if we start decreasing ourselves, we do them a disservice. So Absolutely. Uh, yeah, we can't. Your, your daddy, your mama, you mm -hmm. know, yeah, I ain't saying like your mama, but I'm saying your mama. Yes. <laughs> M-A-M-A. That's it. That's it. Yeah. We're, we're standing on their shoulders. I, I, Robin, yeah. I often say that, that you know, I'm, I'm just a uh, beneficiary yeah. or the recipient of the struggle of others, of, of who sacrificed. Yeah. So had it not been for Elmer Jenkins or, 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 or Vernon or, or Hollis T. Mm -hmm. or, or Joey Brewer or Willie J. Jr., I wouldn't have the opportunity to serve. Yeah. And so yeah. for that, I mean, it's important that I understand that history and I yeah. pass that history along because yeah. any benefits that my children may get because of some people that they've never met. Yeah. And so that's right. when we talk about paying it forward, uh how will you know how to pay it forward that's unless right. you know your history. That's right. And 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 even your story, so you named a lot of people like in the fifties and sixties, even your story goes back to the eighteen hundreds for here. Absolutely. Uh, because you're standing on the shoulders of people like John Sunday, Zebulon, that's Elijah, that's uh right. Pons, who was a who was a mayor, uh the Pensacola Invincible Twenty, these group of black men who got together and quietly, very quietly, influenced the political process, and they call themselves the Pit Club. Right. Uh, and the women who were there too. So women like uh, Mert, right? <laughs> Mert Tyson Mert. Mert Beauty. These, That's right. These 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 amazing uh, women who who were there, whose stories didn't get told. Because of some gender bias, right? right. So, um, uh, which unfortunately still goes on today. Um, and so, so yeah, so we're standing on those shoulders. But you're right. If we don't let those people know, then they think we just overcame in the '60s. Absolutely. Yeah, the 1960s. Yeah, the right? 1960s. Uh, and, 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 and you know, when we talk about those struggles, and that's one of the reasons on May's message during Black History Month that we're honored to bring a living legends and icons like H.K. Matthews. But yeah. we want. Uh, Cassandra Smith and Sheena Payne and mm -hmm. David Williams, mm -hmm. those who are, are educators, and, and we want the Robin Richards and the Robert Hills who are being the voice and the entrepreneurs because yeah. we all make up this community. I mean, that's right. I mean, so there's not one person that has really created the civil rights movement or black history. Mm -hmm. I mean, I often say that you know, one of my favorite quotes of Dr. King was, Without the help of our white sympathetic brothers and sisters, the mm -hmm. movement would be dead. And without the help of our Jewish friends, the movement would have not had any mm -hmm. money. Mm -hmm. And so that everybody has a role to that's play. Right. In the struggle. That's right. That's and, right. And, and saying that, you know, I think the great equalizer of, of equality is education. You know, I, I think that so many people lost their lives for education. Yeah. So many people sacrificed so we can go to school. And, and many times we still become plagued with high dropout rates, uh, high incarceration rates, and, and, and a lack of uh, post training. And I'm, I'm not a person who believes you got to go get a PhD. But what what are the issues that you see facing? And I mean, what, what do you see as some of the solutions that we can? do with our children because unfortunately uh, the say African Americans many people died for them to get the opportunity to go to school and I remember my parents saying I worked too hard because I had used books and I ain't never want my child to have a used book yeah. because my mom and dad never went to school without a used book mm -hmm. <laughs> you know and yeah. you know they were never able to, to uh, have a full meal and so uh, when we look at those things that we've overcome, I still see other challenges, Sheena. And I mean, I'm sure you face it day to day uh, that we don't. So, you want to talk about a little bit of that, or? I think that one of the things we have to continue to be is what our our parents were for us, and that is present, mm -hmm. um, and and present with with discipline, 
present with rules and present with some non-negotiables and absolutes. And in our house, we grew up with, um, you will go. Um, it doesn't matter about how you felt. <laughs> um, if it doesn't Period. matter that you say you, you're sick. You, we had some, some rules and some structure, and so you have to be present. And then there was a certain level, always been a certain level of respect Amen. for the teacher. What the teacher said was correct. That's right. And you better not suggest otherwise. Mm. You could not call anybody an L-I-E, and I spelled it because, you know, I'm still at my age. Around my mother, we still don't call anybody a lie. You told you know, a story. You told a story. You told a story you know, in our house. Uh, yeah. You know, a non-truth teller. <laughs> when did you get grown enough to say that right. word in this so, house? You know, I think yeah. we have to be we have to be present. Um, we have to get involved in the process, and that is, you know, come up um, conferences, work, being present, and find out what's happening with the student from the first day to the last day, and be involved in that. It is knowing that students by a a certain age need to be readers and then they have to be consistent readers. Right. Um, and so that's important. But I, one of the, it's having a voice and being present is, is one of the things I think we have to continue or get back to doing. We have a lot of youth. Yeah. Um, we had, uh, but we also had in our time, we had Big Mama and, mm -hmm. and, and Granddad and everybody that that's told right. you certain things. And, and I think we all know that when, if the structure, if the family structure itself starts to break down and you really don't have to worry about whether or not it will accomplish what it because mm. there's nothing there Amen. and so you have to be able to get back to that and and while I appreciate social media we have to know what our students our children are doing on social media they they shouldn't have an account that you can't get to of any kind you should know what's there you should know look at it constantly it's the same difference as having you couldn't close our social media now to me it's like me growing up in my house and you couldn't close the door right you couldn't right. close the door in my mom's house you had you doors? Know, the door right <laughs> you had right doors. we had wow. doors but it, oh, okay. it, it, it needed to come off the hinges it could <laughs> you know but you didn't close so it's the same thing to me you know we have to be present and present means there's no if i'm responsible for you like my grandma would say you having trouble and you still feeding it that's right so if you are present and that means Means in every facet, your social media, your school, your friends. My mom and dad picked our friends. Right. You know, we have to be present yeah. in every facet so that we can we can be because we are held accountable yeah. for what they do, Absolutely. whether we want to admit that or not. Absolutely. We are accountable for what our children do, and it's so easy to say what they're not doing. Right. And my question is always, well, what are you doing? Right. You know, if it's about what they're not doing, then what are you doing to help them? With because some people don't they know they do they do things because they don't know. That's right. So and they the closest relationships they have are to sometimes to kids or people that are like them who know less than they do. Mm -hmm. But there's a relationship there. Mm -hmm. So being present means I'm in a part of what you're doing, but I've also have an established relationship with you that I am. This is safe, and you can count on me to be present for you. And even when I don't support what you're doing, my mom said I may not go along with you, but I'll be there so people know you're not alone. Right. Oh, yeah. That's a good. Well, you know. <laughs> I mean, we had doors too, but my dad said you can start closing doors when you start paying for it. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. yeah okay. so if you didn't pay okay. for it, or you didn't close, close the door. The door. Out. And yeah. so, you know, I think that many of the values that we shared and coming through, uh, we've forgotten those values. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, respect. Mm -hmm. I mean, when we when adults would talk, children wouldn't talk. Mm -hmm. I mean, and so I often say, Shannon, when we had 13 shootings in the past couple of weeks, uh, mm -hmm. the little children that are dancing and cursing, and it's cute and it's funny. Uh, these same as my, you know, as my mother said, we create that little monster inside of them. We have to begin to instill that discipline. I know that you know, you do. And so often people will uh, take the media and it's on television that all things are just horrible, particularly in the African-American community. Mm -hmm. But I know at your school there are some very, very talented young people. I've come to your honor awards. And so we, are, we do have some young people. We have people who are engaged uh, in your institute yeah. that are learning yeah. things well beyond their age. And so... Uh, unfortunately, uh, we're going to have people who are going to do negative things, but we do have some young people who are being positive and are doing great things in the community. And that's, I mean, that being present that Sheena talked about, that's that's where you highlight that. So it's not, I mean, we have uh, folks doing, this is in the white community, black community, uh, name a color community that you have folks 95% of the way doing what is right and required of them. And the 5% get the 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 attention it's like what do they say you don't report on planes that crash or that land safe you only no, report on the planes, planes that, crash. that 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 crash and and for a long time in this country 
um, we saw in the newspaper the black experience through the eyes of what didn't happen. So wow. it uh, so it wasn't anything positive generally. If it was, it was buried, uh, or it was that such and such went to jail not because they were protesting something, <laughs> but because they were picking something up that wasn't theirs. And so that's what a lot of Americans saw as a black experience. And so while you had people working hard to do the right things and things that were right, those things weren't getting reported on. So mm -hmm. it is up to us to make sure that they are present. But our, our story is so broad and diverse. So I jokingly say mm -hmm. that, you know, we didn't have doors and I, we, we, we did. Uh, we did have newspapers on the wall, though. So that was very <laughs> country, very, very country. That was our wallpaper. But my experience, even if I had newspapers on the walls, is no less and no more important than Sheena's experience with having beautiful doors. Wow. And we have to celebrate all of that because in this country, we unfortunately don't celebrate the black man, the black woman, I'm gonna generalize here, until they do something great in sports, until they appear on TV. So we like the, the person uh, that rose up from being a single parent when they make $12 million, right? right? But on that journey, we don't necessarily care for them. Right. And so that journey is just as important for them right. as it is for the person who gets $12 million out of, you know, the silver spoon right. or whatever, both of those. And so for us to say that, you know, um, black folks didn't do something or we can only do something over here, or we're only in sports or we're only in and this is not fair. But in this country, that's what we've seen, that, that, that presence that Sheena talked about. I know I'm talking two different presences here, but that present had only been in this negative uh, sphere, this, this negative connotation of the black person's experience. And we've done so many amazing things. Um, the early educators that were doing the things before public school came around in churches, that they had the private schools or the home schools or whatever. I mean, these teachers were digging in and, and doing it, yeah, doing it before um, because they wanted their child to have the same uh, right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness as their neighbor, you know, but because of the color of their skin, they weren't afforded that. And so, in some regard, we've kept that theory going that, you know, the, the, the color of your skin says you can't do this. Because right. I'm sure if you say, you know, John Johnson did this, or not, maybe not John Johnson, Brandon, Brandon Smith did this, that people may be surprised that Brandon Smith is black if you don't call out him being black, mm -hmm. right? So they mm -hmm. make this assumption that if you don't call out the color that the person is white or something else. We make assumptions that Brand, if you say Brandon Smith was on the team, you're going to assume on um, basketball team that right. Brandon Smith was black. Right. But if you say Brandon Smith is an honor roll student, we assume that Brandon Smith it's white. So in our collective minds, we do some things that undermine how we see children and their abilities. Right. And, and so that visual thing is so important. No, no, I, I agree with you. I was just going to say media sometimes helps create these preconceived notions mm -hmm. about anticipation yeah. of what something really is, yeah. even though it's not. And, yeah. so you, and so that's why we do this on May's message, uh, Robin, as, we, as we're going to a close. Is because sometimes there are students at West Florida that may not really know Sheena Payne's story. Yeah, you know, and right. so you're right. right. It's very important to share that story because people have to find somebody that they can identify with it. And yeah. if, if it's absent in the home, yeah. I mean, you find somebody that you can. You want? I I remember seeing Willie Jr. not having to wait in line, mm -hmm. and I you know I remember mm -hmm. wanting to be a commissioner. Yeah. And so you have oh, to yeah. identify yourself and tell it's. Don't be afraid to dream. Don't be afraid yeah. to fail. That's right. Because you may not make it. You may not That's become right. the commissioner. You may not become the state rep. Yeah. But at least if you can identify with somebody that you can see, touch, and feel, that's it's right. more of a reality for you. And so that's why I want to thank you both yeah. for coming thank you. Uh, and and sharing your story because I think it's important uh, for the story to be shared. So in closing, Sheena, I'll give you your last thirty seconds. And Robin, I'll give you a 30 seconds and then we'll wrap it up. And the next voice we'll hear, it will be from the Almighty Himself, H.K. Matthews. Wow. <laughs> well, I just, I'm back to where I started. It's easier to build strong children than to repair, repair broken men. And we do that by being present. We talk about um, we need help in all schools. It's not just West Florida. There are great people doing things in the other six, my six other high schools and counterparts. We need people present. If we want it done, then we have to be willing to get in there and roll our sleeves up and do the work as we see it. Amen. Right. Thank you, Ms. Fain. I appreciate it. I appreciate uh, on behalf of your, your current students, former students, as a parent, 
uh, to know firsthand uh, for what you're doing in the leadership that you're providing uh, in the educational world. Uh, we applaud it. Uh, and we're grateful, and we do believe that education is a great equalizer. Mm -hmm. And as long as we have leadership, such as Cassandra Smith, Dave Williams, Dr. Roberts, you, uh, and all the other principals, I, I, I mean, I, and the educators, our, our administrative team, uh, just want to make sure that all kids have an opportunity uh, to achieve is important. So thank you for your contribution. Thank you for the opportunity. Robin. I, I can't do an intro to let you close. I'm just going to be quiet and let you close. I'm going to pass the pad and let you close it because uh, you, you are the voice. Well, I, you know, I, I want to go back to the story that I think it's important to tell the good, the bad, and the ugly of your story. So don't just say that we have this, that you went from A to Z and not talk about the B and then how you had to go back and, you know, the back steps, the missteps that, that the we remedial took. remedial course I took. Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. And, telling, and, tell, and telling our story and tell about those hiccups because that's how we build a community. So not everybody, like, like you said, was uh, a commissioner. There were some people who were doing other things, but they made those commissioners look good. Amen. Right? And so. Just like Loretta so, makes me look good. Ab absolutely, brother. I mean, so, figuratively, <laughs> literally, I mean, all the way around <laughs> from the shoes to the jacket. Well, and it is to tell, it is to tell that story and all about, Sheena talked about it earlier, all about the team that, that brought you along. Because it, it only may be in the story, in the final analysis, it may only be one person that is shown but it's a whole team that's lifting them up and in the, our our experience of black history that's how it has been it's been a whole team of people in this country we have not shared those stories about those other people who have been lifting and and sh and, and holding people up and I think that it's uh, way past time that we do that and Pensacola deserves to hear those stories Amen. we have not been uh, told our full history and we deserve better Absolutely. We need a spanking because we deserve better <laughs> and we can do better. <laughs> we will and we do, can better. do better. <laughs> well, listen, thank you for watching this segment of, of May's Message. Uh, not only will uh, Miss Payne's story or, or, or Mr. Shard's story, but you have a story in your family, an aunt, an uncle, a big mama, a grandmama, a pastor, somebody that made a difference in your life, somebody that made a great contribution. So I encourage you today uh, to share those stories with your children. The old tradition, the old history that we pass down is very important. Thank you for joining us here. We'll see you on the next segment. We are just blessed today uh, in our celebration of Black History Month to have what I call a living legend, an icon, uh, one who has gone through the struggle, who's been arrested, uh, but has still uh, stayed committed, committed to improving the quality of life uh, for all Americans and all Floridians and all Escambia County residents. So please join me. I know that you want to get somebody in uh, and call them and tell them right now uh, the the great H.K. Matthews is on May's message with Commissioner May. Welcome, Reverend Matthews. Thank you, sir. I appreciate you Thank being you. here. I appreciate being here. Well, it's quite an honor for you to drive down uh, from Bruton, Alabama uh, to be on, on May's message. Earlier we had uh, David Hawkins and Robert Hill in, in early in the segments and with Robin Richard and Sheena Payne, and uh, they all said that they would reserve any comments to after you got here. And so uh, those were pretty quick interviews. So with that being said, we have a lot of time for you to share your story. And uh, you did this last year in sharing your story, and we certainly appreciate it. And before we go any further, I know February uh, is your birthday month. You were born in February 29, 1928. And uh, Robin Richard got on my show earlier and said she was 25. Uh, I kind of chuckled at that because I didn't believe her. but. Uh, somewhere I read that you're 29 or is 29 reverse 92? That same as Robin. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll, I'll, I guess I'll have to chuckle again. <laughs> but again, R Reverend Matthews, uh, overwhelming last year when you came on May's message for Black History Month, uh, the amount of people listening and more people that wanted to hear your story and shared uh, was just overwhelming to me. And so today, uh, I just want you to talk a little bit about the H.K. Matthews 
story, uh, the Pensacola struggle, and I know there's some mother and grandmother, there's some children uh, that may have not uh, been a part of the movement, and there may be some that were a part of the movement, but I do understand that, you know, I stand on the shoulders of giants, and uh, without your struggles and sacrifice, without you going to jail and to prison, uh, many of us who have jobs in corporate America, many of us that work in county administration, school administration, uh, municipalities, uh, would not be able uh, to get these jobs without your sacrifices. So with that, I'm going to hand the mic over to you and let you talk a little bit, and then uh, I'll interrupt and ask a few more questions, and we'll close it out. But again, thank you for being here. Thank you, Commissioner May. I, the first thing I, I, I want to say is that I am blessed, happy and blessed to have been able to be here earlier to, uh, to hear from Miss Rashad uh, Robin, as I call her, a friend, and from Mrs. Payne. They don't know uh, the impact that they had on me wow. about the things that they brought forth. Uh, we're always in a learning process. We, we, uh, that, that's why a person is never educated, because once you get educated, you've learned all there is to be learned. And so <laughs> we are always in the process of being educated because we're still learning. And, and I certainly want to thank both of them uh, for their presentation on this Absolutely. show because uh, it was very eye-opening, uh, even to me, uh, because I, I'm a product of some of the things that they were talking about. Uh, I understand what they were talking about, and I appreciate what they were talking about. And uh, so I want them both to know from me how much I, as an individual, appreciated their presentation absolutely because they did a, a a wonderful job they did an educational job uh, they did something that uh, I would hope that every household every person in this city and not only in this city but across this country could hear and especially African Americans because uh, so many of us are suffering from what is called, I call, selective amnesia. Uh, that is, forgetting from whence we've come. Right. And, and I think they both took us back. There's a song that they sang, and I'm not going to, uh, I'm really not going to go into it because if I go into it, I have to take up an offering when I finish. <laughs> uh, but there's a song that says, Take Me Back. Yes, you know, so uh, we were t I was taken back this morning and I thank God that I was able to get here and to listen to what they had to say. Uh, my experience is, is nothing new. Uh, it, it, I, I have nothing to add or to subtract from it from the things that I've already shared on this program. Uh, I was born and reared in <clears throat> a little place called Snow Hill, Alabama and you can't get there from here. But um, <laughs> my, uh, my, gra <laughs> my grandmother uh, was a country school teacher where we had to walk uh, 13 miles a day one way in order to go to school. Uh, all we got was the dust from the bus. We were <laughs> passing by schools in order to get to a school uh, that was designated for colored. So uh, we have come a long way. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I stand on the shoulders, uh, and if you read my book, uh, the introduction uh, is based upon uh, things that my grandmother taught me, mm -hmm. because she was a stalwart uh, in education and in rearing uh, a lone grandchild who was running loose in the woods of Snow Hill. Mm -hmm. So we are in now what is called Black History Month. And I always pause when I get to that point because uh, it disturbs me because we're saying in, in no uncertain terms that we can talk about and uh, at least explore all of the contributions that uh, blacks or African Americans have made in one month's time. They gave us one month 
and they gave us the shortest month in the year. However, it's a leap year. It's a leap year, and uh, we've got an extra day. So, <laughs> so I, I guess I should really be be thankful for that. But uh, I always say that uh, America's history is our history, and our history is America's history. Amen. For there are so many contributions that we have made to the making of this country that there's no way we could talk about it uh, in a 29 or 30 day period. Uh, so therefore, I have always advocated that black history ought to be entwined or integrated into the history books. That way, uh, people would know who we are. And I think that's the problem with a lot of us, even as blacks, uh, we don't really know who we are. We, we don't know our value. We don't know what we have really contributed uh, to the making of America. Uh, and this is why in a lot of instances we really don't appreciate each other because we don't know our history. Mm -hmm. you, you would be surprised there are so many white people who know more about our history Absolutely. than we do ourselves. So uh, I, I'm just glad to be here again. Yeah. Well, Reverend Matthews, um, one, I mean, I'm, I'm going to take a commercial break here. To, how can someone get your book? I mean, how can um, they order your book? Uh, I know there are people watching this show would love to, to read more about, you know, Victory After the Fall. I mean, how can they get that book? It's on Amazon. Uh, and, of course, they can always get it from me. But Reverend Matthew, talk a little bit about the Civil Rights Movement. Uh, I, I sit here on Palafox Street, and, you know, not too many years ago, I probably couldn't sit here on Palafox. I mean, talk a little bit about the sit-ins and talk about a little bit about the things that happened on Palafox and the marches that, that you did here in Pensacola. Well, the sit-ins and the marches uh, up and down Palafox Street, all of this came about because of one person initially, and that one person was Reverend W.C. Dobbins. Reverend Dobbins. William Curtis Dobbins, who, uh, who came here as a United Methodist pastor and was pastoring St. Paul United Methodist Church over on Gaston Street. Mm -hmm. uh, Reverend Dobbins was not actually uh, used to the atmosphere uh, that uh, he experienced here in Pensacola. His wife did a lot of sewing. I guess she, you would call her, classify her as a seamstress. And uh, Reverend Dobbins happened to come to town, downtown Pensacola, to buy some thread uh, for his wife. Uh, I don't know whether it was Cresses or Newberries. We had four or five in dime stores at that time, Woolworth, Walgreens, Cresses, and Newberries. And he went into either Cress's or Newberry's and bought some thread uh, for his wife. And in the process of doing that, before he left, uh, he wanted to get uh, something to drink, uh, a soda uh, or a sandwich. And he went to the counter to sit down and was told immediately by one of the uh, waitresses behind the counter, the counter that if he wanted uh, to get something uh, else, as far as food stuff was concerned, uh, and this was after he had made the purchase of the thread, right. that he would have to go out of the store, go around to a side window, and place his order because uh, they did not serve uh, coloreds uh, in there. And that didn't set too well with Reverend Dobbins, who uh, had not encountered that kind of treatment before. So he came back and he organized what is uh, what wound up being called uh, the Pensacola Council of Ministers as, as it used to be in Montgomery, the Montgomery Improvement Association. But he organized the Pensacola Council of Ministers with the sole purpose of confronting uh, the powers that be in downtown Pensacola. Uh, to find out, and not actually the powers that be, but the store owners mm -hmm. in downtown Pensacola in order to be able to uh, sit at the lunch counters uh, as human beings 
because he felt, and, and all of us felt that way, but we did nothing about it until uh, he made his entrance, uh, that if we could spend our money uh, at the counter, at the checkout counter, to buy thread or to buy other goods that mm -hmm. were there, then we ought to be able to spend our money sitting at the lunch counters right. because it was the same money. Right. And uh, we were human beings like everybody else. And it was a little disheartening to be able to spend your money and then watch people of the other hue or the other race be able to sit down at the lunch counter uh, without uh, any problems. And, but we had to go out of the store and food wasn't that good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We had to go out of the store and go around. Uh, to so you actually window. lived that, and you had to go outside the window to go and eat? Uh, yes. Wow. I, I had done that prior to Reverend Dobbins coming here, wow. and, 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 and I accepted it. I, wow. I, knew, I knew it was wrong, uh, but, you know, I accepted the status quo. You know, we just went along to get along, I guess. Mm -hmm. But there's a chapter in my book that's called Awakening the Sleeping Giant. Mm -hmm. And that chapter is devoted or dedicated primarily uh, to the efforts that Reverend Dobbins initiated as it relates to our being able to uh, be served at the lunch counter. Mm -hmm. So... After he organized, and I was not, this was in 1960, I think, uh, that he organized the Pensacola Council of Ministers, and I was not even in the ministry at that time. I had not uh, started preaching. I started preaching shortly thereafter. I guess I must have gotten converted by being refused. <laughs> uh, so uh, I, I became a, a, a follower of Reverend Dobbins because he brought to the forefront in me things that, that were already embedded in me, uh, but just lying dormant because I, I, I didn't know what to do with it. So we started having mass meetings and we wound up having what was called a selective buying campaign. We were not allowed as the NAACP because the Pensacola Council of Ministers actually became an arm of the NAACP. But we were not allowed to use the word boycott, which would have uh, actually thrown us into a lawsuit uh, because of laws that existed on the book. Right. So uh, uh, he came up with the idea, again, of selectively buying in downtown Pensacola until the merchants agreed to, uh, to serve us at the lunch counter. Of course, that was not, not an easy task because uh, when people get imbe something embedded in them, I, and I think Robin brought up a lot of this today and Mrs. Payne, people get things embedded in them. Sometimes it takes a jackhammer and more than that to get it out of them. Right. So they were determined that they weren't going to serve us at the lunch counters. But our determination was stronger mm -hmm. because we were determined that they were going to serve us or they weren't going to serve anybody. Okay. So hence uh, the entrance of the selected bond campaign and the sit-ins. Now, there are people in this city <laughs> who have said to me, uh, well, Matthews, you not you were not involved in the sit-ins, which you know nothing could be followed from the truth. Absolutely, uh, because you know the way they're talking. If you look at the marker out on Palafox Street, you would think that the sit-ins were uh, conducted, initiated by uh, the Pensacola Council of Students, mm -hmm. but it was initiated by the Pensacola Council of Ministers, not minister. Reverend Dobbins was a catalyst. He was the uh, uh, forerunner, if you may. Mm -hmm. And he convinced us uh, to be followers of the sacrificial lamb that he was mm -hmm. 
at that time. So uh, when people tell me that I was not in the sit-ins, I said, well, it, and I don't mean it's not, it ain't <laughs> up to me to prove that I was there. It's up to you to prove that I was not there. Not there. Uh, so the sit-ins resulted actually because we were asking African Americans, Negroes at that time, not to shop downtown until the merchants acquiesced or decided that they would allow us to uh, sit at the lunch counter. And finally, they did. Amen. Uh, I had an uncle who was a, uh, a Church of Christ minister. His name was Abbott S. Johnson, who would tell me uh, periodically, I was living with him, mm -hmm. and he would tell me periodically, uh, I don't know why y'all don't leave those people alone. They don't, uh, they don't want to serve you. Uh, just leave them alone. And uh, I said, well, I don't think so. I, I don't think Reverend Dobbins would be pleased. Uh, and, you know, our, our, our aim was to be true followers of a true leader. Right. And I think it was said by Mrs. Payne or somebody, uh, either Ms. Richard today, that, you know, in order to be a good leader, you first got to learn to be a good follower. Mm -hmm. So we were followers of, of Reverend Dobbins, and we didn't want to do anything to let him down. And he had sacrificed uh, you know, his, himself, his family. And so, of course, I felt, and most of us did, people like Reverend K.C. Bass and Reverend J.H. Kendricks, Reverend James Young and Reverend Nathaniel Smith, people, Reverend Rufus Hill, I, I think he was here during that time, and Reverend Otha Leverett, mm -hmm. Reverend H.C. Uh, Calloway. Mm -hmm. These were people who felt that it was necessary that we follow Reverend Dobbins' lead because he was willing to step out on faith. Amen. And that's what we did. We stepped out on faith. We didn't step out actually on Reverend Dobbins. We were following him, but uh, we also had our own faith and our own belief that he shook and woke up right. inside of us. So that takes you from you know the marches in Pensacola. I've often heard your speech about making it to Selma, to the Edmund Pettus, and uh, your dear friend John Lewis, uh, who, you know, God, God bless John. Um, but you said you were in the, you weren't at the front of the line, you no, weren't at the sir. back of the line, but no, you sir. were in the middle of the line. I was in the middle. <laughs> and that's why I didn't get, get, didn't get beat so badly because I was in the middle. But that, there were people, even in the back, Miss Amelia Boynton, one of, one of my favorite people, uh, they beat her to a bloody pulp. And of course, John Lewis was in the lead. And I tell John now, at least I haven't seen him for a while, and I said, man, if you had had half, during that time, it would kill you because he had a, he had a great big afro at that time, and uh, of course they that they really beat him. He's a man who really paid a price. Uh, he was a leader. Uh, we had a young fellow the night before the march. Uh, I'm getting ahead of myself, but he said, "Man, we all need to just get armed, and uh, you know, we go, we need to be ready for him." That was that Saturday night before the march. We need to be ready for them, and, you know, we know they're going to try to stop us. And John Lewis said, man, are you crazy? You're going to go up against folk with bazookas <laughs> with a pea shooter. <laughs> you know, we'll, they, they'll annihilate us on that bridge. Uh -huh. So, uh, but, uh, and, and my reason for being involved in that is because if I call myself a leader locally, uh, when there was something global, uh, national, that, that had to be done, then I, I felt that I needed to be a part of that also. Right. So when Dr. King sent the, the call out uh, for people to come to Selma, converge on Selma, you know, I dropped, I was a janitor over at the Physicians Building on Jordan and, Al, Jordan and uh, Palafox. Uh, I dropped my little mop bucket and rag and... <laughs> 
got in my little pink and white Fairlane Ford <laughs> and, and made my way to Selma. I, I didn't have to wonder where Selma was because I was born and reared again in Snow Hill, which was 35 miles below Selma. So I was familiar with that area. Yes, sir. Reverend Matthews, when you think back over uh, the marches in um, the marches on Palafox and being arrested and going to jail and the sit-ins and, and, and being in Selma over the Edmund Pettus and now being 92 years old, do you think that it was worth it? How do you feel? I, again, I feel that it was worth it. Uh, what troubles me, uh, especially about the march for voters' rights, which was, a, you know, the Bloody Sunday March. Uh, the thing that troubles me most about that as I look back, and as I n not just look back, think now, is that so many of our people, uh, when I say that, I mean African Americans, sit at home on election day and won't take advantage of the vote. My vote matters. Right. Uh, and I've heard people say, you know, well, my one vote doesn't matter. And they're right. right. It doesn't matter. If you don't go and cast it, 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 it won't matter. matter. Uh, there's a little town that's not too far from me called Repton. Uh, several years ago, maybe 10 or 12 years ago, the mayor of Repton was elected by one vote. So... You never know whether or not it might be your vote. That counts. That you, counts. You know, Reverend, when you look back over it, as you said, that when Dr. King put out the call uh, to make your way to Selma, when he made that call across the country, across the world, actually, uh, you dropped your mop bucket, left your family. I mean, there had to be a great sacrifice for you know, economic gains, uh, Taking care of your family. I mean, that was. Sac I mean, talk a little bit about those sacrifices because the reason being, there's some person watching this today, not realizing really uh, what those uh, civil rights leaders and icons like yourself, what you really gave up to make it possible for us to have uh, the equality that we have today. Well, yeah, that that that's true, but the disturbing part about that is. I have heard people right here in this city, I have heard adults who had children with them, said, oh, that's uh, that's, that's H.K. Matthews, and, and, and I don't consider myself as anybody. I'm just a convenient person, a country boy, who, who God gifted Amen. with some things. Amen. And uh, I said, they said, no, we don't know who he is. Well, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. You ought to know. So what, what I'm saying is, I get upset with adults who get on to their children who don't know who Robin Rashad is, who don't know who Lumen May is, uh, who don't know who Hollis Williams is, who don't know who a lot of these people are. Well, how are they going to know if the adults don't teach them? Right. And, and I think it's a sad commentary for adults to get upset with young people because they don't know. Right. We've got to teach people who made the sacrifices. Absolutely. And, 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 and not only, you know, I can reflect on my sacrifices. I can, uh, you know, people talk about me and I get all of the accolades and I get the recognition, but I am by no means the only person in this town who gave up a whole lot. Amen. I mean, there are other people in this city who sacrifice a lot. I just happened to be the only one who had the good fortune of being arrested 35 times and shipped off to the state penitentiary twice <laughs> and getting beat on the Edmund Pettus Bridge. But there are other people, including some of the names that I have called, prior to, that you never hear their names mentioned. Right. People like Reverend B.J. Brooks uh, sacrificed a lot, sacrificed his family. Amen. And, uh, you know, sometimes, you know, people don't even mention them. But, but, but they, they gave up a whole lot uh, in order to uh, 
uh, achieve some of the things that we have right now. Absolutely. There, there were, and I guess that's another fortunate situation. Uh, in my book, there were, uh, I mentioned the fact that there were seven contracts out on my life, seven known contracts. But then I found out later on that there was an eighth contract. Uh, which was to be carried out by a member at that time of the Pensacola Police Department uh, that uh, I understand had been authorized, and this came from a former, a retired policeman. Uh, he might not own up to it at this time. If somebody go and interview him, he might say, well, I don't know anything about it. Uh -huh. But who told me this story and said that I had your back. In other words... He was a policeman, but he wasn't a policeman of the nature of some of the others who would do us harm uh, during that struggle. You know, Reverend, I talk a lot about, you know, one of the things that I hold near and dear to my heart is listening to Dr. King and his speeches. And he said, without the help of our white sympathetic brothers and sisters, the movement will be dead. Without the white missionaries coming from the north, in many times, uh, there were people that didn't look like you that were with you. And many times they couldn't be as vocal as you, but they were what I call sometimes the silent heroes behind the scenes. And I know that you often speak about, you know, not just yourself, about others who contributed to the movement. Uh, every year, because of you and, and the Bear Foundation, we take a group of kids up to Selma and we look at the Lynching Museum, we go to the Southern Pro Property Law Center, and, and on that uh, wall of fame, you can see people who never got any recognition, were never written about mm -hmm. in the history books. Exactly. Uh, but I want to just say to you, thank you. Uh, although um, there were others behind it, I don't know if there's anybody still alive that went to jail 35 plus times for civil rights and for equality or that had a contract eight times on their life. And so for, to those who are listening, uh, it is. I mean, uh, I often say, give me my flowers while I yet live. And so for us to be able today to bring you on May's message, that's what it's really about when you just said teaching the next generation is to pass down that oral and written history. I and mean, if we don't have these candid and frank conversations, and then uh, our children will never know. And we're doomed to repeat history if exactly. we don't know history. And so thank you for sharing history. Uh, we couldn't do it without you. Uh, I mean, we pray Godspeed uh, to you. Uh, I, I said to Loretta not long ago, I said, Reverend Matthews has a birthday party every three months, man. But we want you to, <laughs> we, we want you to live forever because it is an honor. I just tell you, as an, uh, an African-American elected official, I know I wouldn't be sitting in this seat without you. I know that without the struggle of people like you, and when you say Reverend B.J. Brooks, a friend, I remember starting Robert Hill was on earlier today, and we talked about community awareness and Dave Thomas and B.J. Brooks and Eugene Brown, and I remember going around with my dad over K.C. Bass House, and when children would yes, get sir. in trouble uh, at the school system, Otha Leverett would be the first one down on Charlie Stokes saying, we're not going to do this. And, I mean, you had those people, uh, Nathaniel Smith, as you said, James Young, Reverend John Roden, uh, all these exactly. unsung heroes who fought, and they wasn't fighting individually for themselves. They were fighting because they wanted a better community for their children, their children, children. And as my grandmother would say, many other civil rights pioneers were praying and fighting for their unborn generation. And thank you for doing that. Well, if I may, I, I want to thank you uh, for the work that you're doing as a commissioner and uh, uh, the sacrifices that you make. People might take them for granted, but you do things that you don't have to do. You do things because you feel uh, as the old people used to say, duty bound to do. Because uh, I, I subscribe very strongly, and, and if I can just say this, uh, there were a lot of white people who made that trek in Selma. Right. Uh, Viola Liuzzo, a lot of people remember, lost her life mm -hmm. uh, in ferreting people back and forth in her automobile. That was a, 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 a Lutheran minister by the name of Reverend James Reeb, who was white, that I watched get beaten to death uh, outside of a cafe uh, there in Selma, helping us. And when we think about Swerner, Goodman, and Cheney, who lost their lives down in Mississippi, 
uh, trying to get blacks registered to vote. So to all of these people, including yourself, including people like Robin Rashad, uh, and, and including so many African Americans, my hat is off to them and to you. Because even though, you know, we paved the way, but y'all chose to walk therein. And by doing so, you're making it better for our community. Well, Matthews, I want to thank you for coming on May's message to share your story. Uh, in closing, uh, it's always, uh, you always close out with something, uh, some good days and some bad days. And uh, if you think it's not robbery, I'd love for you to close the show out with that. Well, it, 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 and that just dates back and, and, and even to now uh, as to what, what my feelings are. Uh, taught the sacrifices that have been made. And of course, I can only talk about me uh, to this point, is that, that I, I've, I've had some, some good days. And, yes, sir. And I've had some hills to climb. I've had some <laughs> dreary days and some sleepless nights. Yes, sir. But, uh, but when I look around <laughs> and think things over, my Lord. all of my good days, uh, outweigh my bad days, and I, I, I won't complain. Some sometimes my clouds hang low. Yeah, I can hardly see the road, and I ask the question, why, why, Lord, why so much pain? <laughs> but He knows. He knows what's best for me. Yeah, more than these old eyes can ever see. And so I said, Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> I, I won't, won't complain. complain. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Reverend. Thank you for being here. And I won't complain. And uh, those are earlier today and having people on this show, uh, the young people as Sheena Payne and David Hawkins and Cassandra Smith and Robert Hill, Robin Richard. I think that uh, you find that because of your selfless service, because the legacy that you continue to build motivates all of us to want to serve and do better. Thank you for joining May's message. Uh, and celebrating with us the great contributions that local unsung heroes have made uh, to our community. We want to thank Cassandra Smith, uh, we want to thank David Hawkins, Robert Hill, Robin Richard, Sheena Payne, and of course the icon Reverend H.K. Matthews for sharing his story. Our community is a great community because of you and because of the leaders that we have. Red, yellow, black, and white, we're all precious in God's sight. We can break down the barriers that separate us by simply loving each other. So on behalf of County Commissioner Lewis May, uh, always remember, we love you. <laughs>